Now, entrepreneurs who are organized and methodical in record keeping show competence, professionalism, avoid legal and regulatory problems, and grow their small businesses. Record keeping in business is required by the law. Common sense, ethics, corporate governance, and best practice stipulate keeping proper books and records in business. Now, prospective entrepreneurs should first cultivate the habit and master the art of record keeping before starting up their businesses. Well, welcome to Business Insight in Plus TV Africa. I am Justin Akadoni. Now, Nigeria's inflation hits 15.40% amid high food prices, just as its public debts hit. 38 trillion naira. Uh, let's take a highlight of major business stories that ran it up uh, this week in Nigeria. The headline inflation moderated by 60 basis points, BPS, to 15.40%, the lowest level in 12 months. Specifically, food inflation moderated by 1.09 percentage point PPTS year-on-year YOY to 17.21% owing to the supportive base effects. This is coming at the backdrop of the unitized demand pressure witnessed on the month-on-month -month MOM food inflation reading. Conversely, the core inflation was up by 61 BPS, reflecting continued price pressure on cooking gas. The Death Management Office, DMO, says Nigeria's public death hit 38.005 trillion in the third quarter, 2021, due to the issue of euro bonds. This is according to a press release titled DMO Publishes Total Public Death for Quarter 3, 2021. The $4 billion euro bonds issued by the government in September 2021 accounted for the majority of the increase of $2.540 trillion compared to the similar amount of $35.465 trillion at the end of quarter two, 2021. According to the DMO, euro bonds have benefited the economy by raising Nigeria's external reserves, consequently sustaining the Naira exchange rate and providing critical funds for the federal government to finance various projects in the budget. The governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Godwin Emefiele, says most of the roads constructed in the country will be told to repay the loans used to fund them. Emefiele said this on Wednesday while answering questions after the two-day retreat of the Bankers Committee in Lagos. He said most of those roads will be told and we know that in many other countries in the world, roads are told because those projects are commercially viable. The United Arab Emirates, UAE, has increased the number of flight slots given to the Nigerian flag carrier, Air Peace, to seven per week from an initial one per week. It has also granted the Nigerian carrier the permit to fly directly to Dubai instead of just Sharjah airport. Dubai Civil Aviation Authority announced the slot extension in a letter to the Air Peace chairman amid an ongoing diplomatic row between Nigeria and the UAE. It said the letter was with regard to slot availability at the DXB Terminal 1 and as a gesture of goodwill and in support of UAE and Nigerian relations in case Airpeace wishes to start their flight, slots have been blocked by Dubai airports. The continued shortage of foreign exchange in the country may delay the proposed rollout of the fifth generation network as the two telecommunication companies which won the 3.5 GHZ spectrum band begins plans to acquire major equipment worth a million of dollars from overseas. On Monday, MTN Nigeria and Mafab Nigeria Communications Limited won in the Nigerian Communications Commission live auction of the two available slots of 100 MHZ TDD slots of 3.5 GHZ bands. The auction ended at $273.6 million for each available lot and each winner 
is mandated to pay latest February 2022 or lose the license, according to the Commission. And those were the stories that rounded up business for this week. For small business owners everywhere, record keeping is a necessary and sometimes tricky part of making sure a business runs smoothly. Now, Rita Babalola is the lead consultant at Beacon Gate Limited. She has over 20 years' experience spanning the banking industry, worked in the oil and gas industry, and as a director in charge of business development and human resources. She joins us now as we look at the need for record keeping and accountability for SMBs. Good evening to you, Ruth Babalola. Many thanks for joining us on Business Insight and Plus TV Africa. Good evening. Thank you for having me on board. All right, let's talk about um, record keeping. You know, for some small business, you know, especially if it's just owned by one person, they tend to say that uh, they know how much they uh, expend and how much income they make. So they just feel that uh, they don't really need uh, a proper record keeping. Why has this become very important? Okay, you see, for most entrepreneurs, they probably started out their business as a result of their passion, as a result of their hobby. So when the business is not evolving, they find it very difficult to go beyond that stage and they think to them it feel that, oh, they can still manage it. But they've forgotten that for you to have record keeping, you, it is a kind of accountability that you need to have as an individual. Everything that does not get recorded, does not get measured, you begin to have problem with it. So when they don't keep record, they assume they will know every of the information concerning their businesses. You have funds going out, you have funds coming in, you have expenses that you do every day. So once you don't record them down, whether manually or electronically, you will run into problems because the brain is not designed to hold as much information as you think you can hold on to. So I think for record keeping for SMEs, they need to know the practicality of trying to record things down. Once they don't do it, they begin to falter. And when you begin to falter, the business itself becomes shaky. So for me, I would think record keeping is very important. They need to understand that they cannot record everything manually. They cannot put everything onto their brain. You still need to put one form of measures, and that involves writing down, or as well as getting an electronic copy of anything that you're doing, trying to put something online, whether you're using Excel, whether you're trying to use Pivot, whether you're trying to use any of this software, you need to put something down. Thank you. All right, um, Rita. Fine, we understand that you need to keep um, uh, um, adequate records, uh, but at what point would you need um, external um, help in terms of uh, making sure that um, your records are accurate? And uh, so in case you need to use it for something formal, just when do you really need to have um, external help in such um, scenarios? Okay, it depends on the scope of your business operations. When the business scope is evolving and you find yourself forgetting so many things at the same time, when you need information as at when you need this and you begin to like start looking for documents, you need to start looking for information that next ordinarily you should have at your fingertips, then you know you need to ask for external help. External help will also be like an internal help because for um, small businesses before they evolve, they don't think about having a team structure, having somebody in-house, whether as a bookkeeper, whether as an account clerk, whether as somebody in-house that can just manage finances. So from going before you get to the external help, you need internal help as well. Get somebody in house to do your record for you. You don't have to do everything yourself. So you need to get somebody internally, and then you now extend to externally. By the time you're handling scope or volume of your business, you see how it is, and you, you can begin to see the scope of work, and you need to send invoices out, you need to send way bills, you are selling, and you need to make use of journals. When those journaling problem becomes easier for you, then you know you need an external um, help one way or the other. And most of the time, we think as entrepreneurs that those people are very expensive. You don't want to pay high fees. But the part of ignorance that you're going to pay in terms of defaulting, in terms of tax regulation, in terms of uh, maybe government regulations, they are quite expensive, even to your own working internal working arrangement. So it's better for them to seek out external help. All right, fine. Uh, Rita, uh, in um, your talk, you mentioned um, bookkeeping. You talked about accounts, clerks, and accounting. Is there um, any uh, differentiation between uh, uh, bookkeeping and uh, proper accounting? Yes, there is a bit of um, 
I would say there is much difference in it. Why I use a bookkeeper, depending on the scope of your business, if you're a small micro-managed business, an owner-managed business, and your staff strength is just between three or four, and your scope of work, I mean, your scope of volume of work is just below maybe like a 5 million, a 10 million, a 20 million per month, then you just need somebody that comes in periodically to come and help you balance your books, record the receipts. Oh, you have made payments to so, 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 and so people. Um, incomes are coming in from other people. How do you record this down? How do you want to measure it? So those are basic things that you need help for. And not most entrepreneurs are grounded in accounting functions. If you are not so versatile in finances or record keeping, then you know you need help. But if you're someone that has the practicality of working in the uh, in another firm before, you've worked in as, uh, probably as an employee somewhere, you've handled the finances, you have, you've handled work elsewhere, you feel you can manage yourself financially, then you can start with yourself, get yourself into the bearing, get yourself into the hacks of trying to balance your book at the end of each day. If you can't do it at the end of each day, then set up records that you need to do it, maybe probably on a week weekend basis. But record keeping must surely be done. So once you have that in at the back of your mind, you are self-accountable to the fact that there is a particular time every week, every day of the week that you need to set aside to be able to balance your book. All right, fine. Uh, let's talk about um, one issue that most um, small business owners have, which is uh, separating um, personal finance uh, and income or revenue from that of um, the business. Because sometimes they have issues when it comes to, you know, uh, separating uh, which money is for the company or the business and which is for private. And other times, too, they tend to do a bit of drawings and they might not really know uh, exactly how much they have made uh, from such a venture. So how, how do you come in here? So what should be done in that particular scenario? Okay, so for this kind of scenario, honestly, most of us as entrepreneurs, we're falling into that trap because you feel you can separate the two. But believe you me, you get to the point where everything gets modeled up. So I tell people when you're starting out in business, no matter the scope of your business operation, have this at the back of your mind that you need to separate your personal account from your business account. As individuals, we all know how the cost of living is in Nigeria right now. So no matter what it is, when you separate the two, you know the inflows going in goes into the corporate account. You know whatever personal money you want to spend for yourself goes into your personal account. So for me and other people like I coach with regularly, I tell them at the end of the week, at the end of the month, depending on your personal expenses, try to set aside a certain fund and move it to your personal account. I call it sometimes when I first started my business, I used to put myself in like a telephone allowance. I put myself my fueling allowance, transport allowance. Those are things that are necessity in your business. So as entrepreneurs, you don't have to wait till the end of the month to pay yourself a salary. Because if you don't do this thing periodically like that, as the expenses come up, you get used to the heart of dipping your hands into the coffers of the organization's um, accounts. Because imagine every day you burn diesel. Every day you need to pay for probably one or two things like petty cash. And then you need to make expenses, but you're waiting for yourself at the end of the month, 30 days. And then before the 30th day, there's no way you won't be dipping into your I mean, company's account because you are human. You want to meet needs at home. You want to meet personal needs. You want to buy yourself lunch. You want to cook. You want to buy some other things. So as individuals, in order to have that self-discipline and control, if it's a weekly basis, I have an entrepreneur that's a creative director that sells. And he told me himself that, you know what? When he started out himself, he thought he could do it on a monthly basis, but he has learned to pay himself every week. So when he gets outfit to sew, at the end of the week, what he does is he moves a certain amount of money to his personal account. And then you can spend money from your personal account. And then one killer thing that we do as entrepreneurs, we don't pay ourselves salaries. You just assume the corporation's account and your personal account are one and the same. Ownership is synonymous with you running your account. After all, you are the owner of your business. You can spend the money the way it is. But that is a wrong notion. So for every entrepreneur, that self-accountability of trying to know what your expenses are on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, then you pay as yourself that kind of money and you move it every week. If you feel you can manage yourself or you have somebody that is financing you elsewhere, then you cannot say, oh, I want to do this on a monthly basis. But if you cannot accommodate monthly basis, then I want to enjoy them. So please state, I mean, start with the weekly deductions. 
pay yourself weekly and move and separate your personal finances from the company's finances. Okay, so Rita, if I got you correctly, you are saying uh, specifically there's nothing wrong in um, actually putting yourself on a salary if you own your own business. Yeah, there's nothing wrong in it. We call it delayed gratification in some cases, but delayed gratification doesn't mean to be stringent on yourself because when you're saying the money, there is no way you get to the point you will just start stealing from the company's money. I call it internal stealing. Now you find yourself that it's not even your staff that are stealing from the company, but you're also stealing from your company. Because when you when you draw up a list and you have so much expenses and you can't match it with the revenue coming in, you begin to steal. You begin to take on the coffers of the business. And that's why we as entrepreneurs, our businesses in this part of the world fail to scale up to something efficient, to something that is profitable. And I tell people, it's not all business that is sustainable. If your business is not sustainable and you've been running it for three, five years and it's still just yourself managing your business, then that means you I mean, it's like you're having a, talk, a baby and the baby can't work at the age of two or three years. And it's the same way with a business. So if you run a business five years, you cannot transit and scale up that business. It is because of one, I mean, some of these things that we fail to do as entrepreneurs. That personal accountability is not there. So I will enjoy them to always pay themselves. It is a necessity. That's why at the end of the month, a laborer deserves his wages. As an entrepreneur, as the head of your business, as the chief evangelist of your business, as the accountant of your business, as the, you wear all caps, you need to pay yourself. Thank you. All right, uh, well said. Uh, so at least uh, you know that uh, you're actually making money and even if you do, you're not getting it, uh, you could actually plow, plow it back to you, you know, you your uh, business. Let's talk about employing um, back profits. Uh, sometimes some people uh, uh, say uh, that um, uh, if I'm making profit, um, I should actually be enjoying it. You know, so at what time or what percentage uh, ordinarily should you be plowing back uh, in case uh, you make profit or some income from your venture? Okay, this is a tricky question, and then you can address it this way. You still need to know your, your needs. You need to know what you, your business brings in. There are three areas that you need to what you earn, what you owe, and what you spend. That will determine how you balance what you need to pay yourself, whether as delayed gratification or whether in adding back to your business. When I started my business, whenever whatever income I make, I make sure that 50% of it goes back into the working capital. I call it, call it like building up my working capital reserve. For some people, it could be 80%. So you still need to work around these parameters, what you want as a, as a business person, what your business itself holds and comes in as income into the organization, and then what the business itself holds as an asset. By the time you match these three parameters together, you'll be able to determine what percentage you will plug back into your business. A business that does not pull out back some of its profit is only setting itself for failure. Right, so uh, there is that element of business. You need to plow it back. So the percentage now depends on also the scope of your business operation. If your business is such that requires heavy capital, huge financial outlay, you know at least 60 or 70% of your money must go back into the business. But like I also said, you must be able to manage your internal expenses what you hold out, and then what you are also expending out of the organization. You have bills to pay. There's PHCN, there's internal network, I mean, there's, uh, what do you call it, data, there's call cards. So you, you must know what you need to pay out at the end of the month. Then, of course, you're also talking about salaries for your employees. You're also talking about cost of doing business in Nigeria. You know, those ones that you don't necessarily think about, but like they can surprise you one of these days and you just meet them at the corner of your office waiting for you. So those are things, are expenses that are incidental to the running of your business. So you need to make provision for them. So at that point in time, that is when you can now decide what percentage needs to go back into your business or your cash reserve or what you call building up your reserve. All right, many thanks um, to you, Rita. I wish we had um, more time to even talk because there's a whole lot um, that um, young and new businesses need to learn concerning record keeping and, of course, um, accountability. Thank you so much, Rita. Yes. Okay, then. thank you so much for having me on. Thank you. All right, keeping clear records of income, expenses, employees, tax document, and account isn't just good business. It can bring you peace of mind and help you monitor progress towards goals and save you time and money.
all right, uh, away from all of that. And I'll be giving you new tips on how you can actually revive uh, your growing business. Five ways to revive a dying business. Is your business showing signs of distress or is it straight up thanking? There are simple measures you can take to bring it back from the brink. Your business might be dying, but it doesn't have to mean it's over. Here are five things you can do to save your dying business and also help it thrive. 1. Evaluate your situation honestly. Before physicians treat a patient, they do all kinds of tests and make a diagnosis. So when you realize that your business is in serious trouble, stop. You need to take a good hard look at your company to evaluate and access what's going wrong. You can't take action without knowing where to start. Second, rethink your strategy. The way you think about your failure is key to your success. After reevaluating your company, chances are you have found where you went wrong and you're ready to redefine and rethink your strategy. You have decided not to give up and you are determined to succeed. This is a great step in reviving a dying business, but it's also a hard one. Three, focus on your people. You may think that the problem is in your software, hardware, or your data, but the best business are the ones that run with soul. Your most important asset are your people, your employees. When your company seems to be falling, reevaluate not just your strategy, but those who need to execute it. If necessary, get rid of those who are slowing you down and hire those who will help you revive your dying business. Four, let go of pride and fear. Rather than playing the blame game, which will get you nowhere, successful CEOs and business leaders know that admitting their faults and showing genuine humility will help rebuild and reboost the organization. When business leaders are unwilling to change or stick to preconceived ideas of what they think will work, it is a recipe for disaster. And five, don't lose your passion. Now, passion is what made you start your business in the first place, and it will help you to keep going. Passion may not always come with the voice of reason, but it may be the fuel you need to reignite that fire. So you see, your business can actually thrive. And that's the size of the show for this week. I am Justin Akadonye. See you again next time. Bye for now.